Our speaker this evening is Dr. Margaret Mead. She needs no introduction. But in our strange society, the ritual of introducing well-known and long-announced speakers is Indeed, the natives may implicitly imagine that the introduction rite of passage helps the speaker transcend the status of unrecognized person to recognized and accoladed authority. The native audience sympathetically expresses awe at the long list of titles, accomplishments, honors, and deeds as they are recounted in a magical rhythm. The speaker, in this case a participant observer in our society and many others throughout the world, is expected to participate in the ritual by sitting quietly with an appropriate, pleasant facial expression while some local functionary, such as the village keeper of the professional umbilical cord, contemplates the rite in an appropriately polite period of time. All participants in the ritual, the native audience, the speaker, and the local keeper of the umbilicus, carefully avoid smugness, even in the present situation when all participants know full well that the speaker is as familiar and recognized as the American flag mom, and apple pie. Dr. Margaret Mead is a person for all seasons. She has grown up in New Guinea and come of age in Samoa. She has contemplated change in American Indian tribes and exchanged new lives for old in Oceania. She has probed Soviet attitudes towards authority while admonishing her own countrymen to keep their powder dry her ethnographic endeavors include not only the cheek-by-jowl range, but studies of culture at a distance. In motion pictures, she has tranced and danced in Bali, followed four families, and bathed babies in three cultures. Scribes jot down her conversations, and her journals are produced in sound and color. Given a platform, she will readily attempt to place in perspective human phenomena ranging from Arapesh excesses to Marrakesh expresses. Her topics, if not her observations, may as often elicit polemics as praise. Witness such subjects as sex and temperament, males and females, cooperation and competition, and the American woman. Yet this is all in the life of an anthropologist, as evidenced in her books at titled Anthropologists and What They Do, and An Anthropologist at Work. Margaret Mead miraculously appeals to diverse audiences. Her Red Book readers revel monthly as their old eyes attempt new ways of seeing. And yet, the now generation jubilates as the head of their class proposes not only the legalization of pot, but its availability at age 16 a full two years younger than the Iowa legislature may yet allow the legal imbibing of alcohol. Some of these perspectives are woven together in her recent and perhaps most thought-provoking book entitled Culture and Commitment, A Study of the Generation Gap. Dr. Mead is an adjunct professor of anthropology at Columbia University and a curator emeritus of ethnology at the American Museum of Natural History. Her other titles, achievements, deeds, and honors stacked end-to-end -end would reach from here to Huxley. <laughs> Several years ago, Time Magazine awarded Margaret Mead the title Mother to the World. That, in my opinion, is too much for any one person to conceive. Could we perhaps just settle this evening for meeting Margaret Mead as the anthropologist's anthropologist, or in a larger sense, the human being's human being? I think these qualities will be seen as she addresses herself and us to the subject, the undetermined future. No, I want to stand. Dear colleague, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, 
and persons, in case there's anybody here who doesn't want to be either a lady or a gentleman. <laughs> when I went into anthropology, our major task was to go to the four corners of the earth and record the life of remote people before it disappeared because we realized it was going to disappear and that as a worldwide technological civilization swept over the world, we would never again have the kind of records that still existed of people who hadn't changed their way of life very much for thousands and thousands of years and only existed because they were out of range. They were in jungles or in Arctic wastes or somewhere where nobody wanted to go yet. And if we went and froze in the Arctic or got eaten by mosquitoes in the tropics and brought back a record of other people's lives, this was supposed to be what we were, all that we were expected to do. But after I'd been in anthropology not very long, we began to realize that these remote peoples gave us a kind of laboratory where we could begin to study something about human beings in a way that we couldn't do in real laboratories where we experimented on human beings. Now, the problem of experimenting on human beings is a very important one today, and there are a great many discussions about it. The anthropologist has believed that you let history make the experiments, and that what we would do would be to travel quite a great distance very often to find people, for instance, who thought it was a good idea to hang the baby on the wall. Now, if you hang the baby on the wall in a cradle board, instead of putting it a, in a baby carriage and putting yourself back of the baby carriage so the baby can never see you, and the only thing the babies can see, that baby isn't in a baby carriage, I don't believe. Um, the only thing the baby can see are the things out in front of it, or you leave your baby lying flat on its back to commune with the ceiling, which is one of the things we believe in. Um, <laughs> you will never know what would happen if you hung the baby on the wall, but on the other hand, to advise people to go and hang their babies on the wall, if you don't know the consequences, is risky. And sensible mothers don't want to experiment with their children. But if you find a people that think the perfect place for a baby is hung on the wall, and that they are doing the thing that they think is best for their children and probably been doing it for 5,000 years, you get a chance to study how babies who are hung on walls behave. And you get a considerable range of information about what human beings could be like if they weren't like us. Now, which isn't going to be available very much longer as all of us are exposed to the same worldwide satellite network and all of us come into one system. In fact, 25 years ago it looked as if we would never again have the possibility to look at people who were really different from ourselves. There is now the possibility that if we built space satellites and let people live on a nice uh, self-renewing satellite in outer space for several hundred years, they might develop into quite different people again. But we, we don't even show any signs of doing that at present. So finding people who behave differently, studying them, with re respecting them for who they are, but bringing back the results so that we can all think about it, was a sort of second stage in anthropology. And then with the end of World War II, we, a few of us, began thinking about a third stage and that is that the anthropologist who had lived in so many different kinds of societies ought to take a hand in culture building. You see, we, first we went in for culture saving or culture salvaging, that's called salvage anthropology today, and finding the thing that was going to vanish and recording it before it vanished, or in the uh, specialty of my chairman, finding the monument or the precious archaeological record that was going to be plowed up and destroyed if we didn't do something about it. And all of this is, can be thought of as salvage, salvage of very precious things that would otherwise get lost. Then we moved on to taking advantage, and in a sense almost doing experimental anthropology, 
to find out new things that we didn't know, but about old people, as it were. And now we're in a world where we know very little about what the future is going to be, but the future will be to some extent determined by what we do now. And in the course of that 50 years that I've been working in anthropology, uh, we've also moved from a kind of society where most old people could say to young people, you know, young man, I have been young, but you have never been old. And this uh, gave all the older people a tremendous advantage, and it was true. You know, they all had been young, and all the young people had never been old, and it was quite a talking point in dealing with young people. Today, however, the young can say to the old, uh, but only because of the generation gap that came at World War II, yes, but you've never been young in the world I grew up in, and you don't know anything about it. And I will never be the kind of old person you are, which is lonely. It's lonely for everybody. It's lonely for the older people who in the past could always look at young people and say, someday he'll hold my job, someday he'll hold this chair, someday he'll plow these fields. And this has kept people going for 100,000 years, looking at the young who were going to do the same things their elders did. And now suddenly, all of us who grew up before World War II are looking young, at young people who are different enough because they've grown up in a different world. So they never will hold the jobs and do the things that we do as we do them. And it's lonely for the young people because they can't find any models anywhere. They can't find anyone who ever had their experience and is older than they are. Now it isn't quite as lonely as it was on college campuses five years ago because f uh, five and six years ago, undergraduates were the senior citizens, the oldest, wisest people of the new generation, and it weighed on them very heavily. When they looked at the state of the world, they felt they had to fix it immediately. And there was, n there was no one older than they were who had had the experience they've had. Today, the generation gap has moved up, the oldest are 26 and 27, and the undergraduates can re relax a little and feel that the people who are out of college can carry on some of the work that they thought they had to do, which I think is the major reason why college campuses are quieter now, because the turmoil has moved up into medicine, into law, into teaching, and again, you still have a, a considerable confrontation between the oldest members of the new generation and the members of the old generation who see things differently. But as the members of the new generation get older, and in 10 years they'll be 35, you know, and 20 years they'll be 45, and there won't be many of us left. And gradually there won't be any generation gap, it'll be pushed off the top. And in 10 years there will be people on the other side of the gap who have adolescent children. But of course at present there aren't. So all teenagers are on one side of the gap and all their parents are on the other, and people thought this was about parents and children, but it isn't about parents and children. It's about a gap that separated everybody because so many things changed in the mid-1940s. Now, we're, we're exceedingly conscious of the fact that the future is going to be different but we are being bombarded at present with pictures of the future of a great variety of sorts. And what I want to talk particularly about tonight is the consequences of the kinds of pictures of the future that we build up now. Because it's our expectation of what the future will be that is operative in the present. The only way that the future can determine what we do is what we think about it at present. Now in the 1950s, a novelist named Neville Shute wrote a book called On the Beach, which was then translated into a movie. And it was the first movie that was shown on both sides of the Iron Curtain the same night when it came out. And we had 
observation teams watching the response to this film to see what would happen. I'd just like to know for my information, because that's the reason I give lectures, um, how many people in this audience have read the book on the beach? Pretty good. How many people saw the film? Now, most people thought that book, which was the story of life in Australia when a terrible nuclear sickness was sweeping over the whole world, was about the Holocaust that a nuclear war might bring on. Uh, actually, Mr. Shute wrote it to express his disgust with Australia because he had gone to Australia thinking this was a new, wonderful civilization, and when he got there, he found everybody was very good-natured, and none of them were politically inclined at all, and they didn't intend to do anything about anything. So he gave them a terrific dose of nuclear sickness, um, and then chronicled the way they simply accepted it. And they were decent to each other and kind to each other, and they arranged to chloroform the dogs, and didn't plant any more rose trees and gradually waited for death. And when this was shown in the Soviet Union, they simply hit the ceiling. Why wasn't everybody in a laboratory working hard to correct this nuclear uh, sickness? Why weren't they working up to the very last minute? Why were they lying down and doing nothing? And we had a variety of, of different responses of this sort in different parts of the world. But the, on the beach, as Neville Shute wrote it, did point up the difference between the belief that the future is fixed and you cannot do anything about it, and what people do if they think the future is fixed, as compared with people who think the future is open, and that one can do all sorts of things about it. Now, we think, as a people, that the future is in front of us. In fact, I think if you examine yourself, you know there's no place else the future could be but in front of you. But in Bali, the future is behind you. You stand still, and the future catches up with you, which is a perfect other logical way of looking at it. And the Balinese look on the future as if it were an exposed but not developed film. Now, if you think it for a minute, if all of you had a script for the future and it had already been photographed, but you haven't developed it yet. But in developing, you can't do anything to it except develop it. It's, it's there, it's fixed. And so they look at anything that happens as something that was determined, but you may not understand it yet. So if you go down, for, for instance, the, a group of traveling players come into the town and you send somebody down to ask them who's going to play the princess in a particular play. And they'll say, it's not yet clear. Now, it doesn't mean that it hasn't been determined, they just don't know it yet. But when they finally have an argument and decide who's going to do it, their sense of what they're doing is that they are doing what was already settled. So they have no sense, really, that they are in control of the world in any way. Now, Americans have traditionally believed that we, could go, we were going ahead into a future that we controlled, that we could make what we wanted of it. And we're in an, a very new bind now as we're being exposed to all sorts of prophecies of various kinds of doom. Now, the first prophecies that we faced were when the first bomb, when the atom bomb went off. And for a very long time, first, the first American response when they first heard of the bomb was, well, it isn't such a bad death, you never knew what hit you. Then John Hershey wrote a book called uh, Hiroshima, in which people began to think that they might be alive for two days without a doctor and a nurse. And that really worried them, because Americans on the whole are not afraid of sudden death, but they do not like not having good medical care while they're getting there. 
Then we worked to try to find some figure which would convey to Americans and to the rest of the world, but particularly to us ourselves, what it was like to face a kind of future that no one had ever thought of before, really. A future in which there would be nobody alive on Earth. Because in the past, each society, although it might think about it, it would be annihilated itself. But they didn't face the possibility there'd be nobody here at all. There's a difference between being afraid your own country will be engulfed by a tidal wave or destroyed by an army or something. But there'll be a lot of other people somewhere else. And the notion there mightn't be anybody here at all. I found that on the whole, the best way to get this idea over to an American audience, they weren't pleased with it, and they weren't very anxious to think about it, was that if there was a complete nuclear holocaust, not only would you be dead, and the people for whom you took your life insurance out would be dead, but the insurance company would be gone. <laughs> that is a pretty good figure of speech for the end of the world, for Americans. Because the insurance company is the way we think about the future and by not thinking about it, you see. You take out awfully good insurance for your wife and then you don't have to worry. And you don't have to talk about your death because you took out the insurance. And we went through a period of of trying to understand and trying to face the dangers of nuclear war and gradually understanding of what nuclear war might mean spread around the world and we got a hotline from Moscow to Washington and we moved from the period when we were very much afraid if a wild goose flew across the radar screen somebody might let loose a nuclear war to the period when the American ambassador went swimming with a hydrogen bomb off Madrid. Um, and gradually, we began to believe that this was something we could control. And that, in fact, the very size of the bomb and the fact you could measure it and find it was there and use a Geiger counter to find out whether it was there or not and use a um, seismograph on the other side of the world to find out if anybody was practicing with a bomb. All these things were very good. It gave us something manageable and that we could gradually work out controls. It was dangerous and it would always be dangerous that we, man had changed. That it was a kind of second loss of innocence because the human race would now always have the power to destroy itself. And we would always have to be alert to see that we didn't. But we began to believe that we, we could manage and that we didn't need to destroy ourselves. And at the same time, we were looking around the whole world, which we now knew about. We knew where everybody was. We knew about how many people they were. We knew that there was nobody on this planet except ourselves. Now, which is a very recent piece of knowledge. Right up to World War II and even a little after, people hoped that somewhere we'd find something different. You know, some people hoped they'd be very inferior creatures so we could enslave them with a good conscience. And uh, other people hoped we'd find Superman or even the abominable snowman. That somewhere there was something different from ourselves. And it really wasn't until well after World War II that we were quite sure that nowhere on this planet is there anybody but Homo Sap. We're stuck with him. And also in the early 1950s, we were still thinking that there was possibility of, of other life in the solar system. And we even had a film made by the American Tell and Tell uh, called Mr. Sun, which showed how after we'd plundered this planet till it was unlivable, we all got in a spaceship and went careering off to another nice planet to plunder and would do very nicely. And there was a period of enormous optimism in which people felt we were going to go into space, we'd probably find a lot of good real estate in space, and we'd get a lot new space. And that anyone who had said the American frontier was closed uh, was wrong. I found it very... Uh, appealing, the idea we'd have some new space. And that it was a period when people were saying, well, you know, we don't have any new land, 
but we do have uh, spiritual frontiers. And we'll all shift from the fun of uh, exploring new land to the, uh, expanding our spiritual horizons. And somehow they weren't as enticing as the idea of some new land and some new space and what we might do with it. Now, most of you weren't even in grade school at this period, but one finds still in when you ask students about in 14 year olds about the future and they'll and about uh, space exploration they'll say well you know I used to be interested in space when I was young <laughs> but we've been going to the moon ever since I can remember and I'm more interested in urbanization in the inner city now of course I know space exploration will solve the population problem now this is a fantastic belief that you find all over this country because people in the early 1950s suggested it might. And we've known for 15 years that you aren't going to solve the population problem by colonizing the moon. Uh, but it's, the idea is still around as one of the things that people are thinking about the future. And then we found that we really had to look for the first time at the future of, a, of the world with enormous populations on other continents where people were terribly poor and from our point of view terribly backward and they didn't have enough to eat and they weren't literate and they had no medical care and they were miserable. But we were fairly convinced we could fix that, that all we needed to do was to send our technical know-how to them and 1% uh, of our gross national product, this is the figure that was fi uh, fixed by various religious groups that if we gave 1% of our gross national product, which is one-ninth of what you were supposed to give to God, so it wasn't too much, um, <laughs> and enough technical know-how, all the other countries in the world would be able to catch up. Now at this period, the picture of the future was a little odd because we were going to stay the way we were on the whole. In about 1954, Time magazine did a study of people called campus leaders all over the country. I don't know what they'd get today if they looked for campus leaders, but it was very easy to find campus leaders in 1954. And they asked them to give a picture of the future. And they gave a picture of the future where they were going to be identical with the richest and most successful person they knew. They didn't even change the make of the car. They didn't change anything. They were just going to grow up and get that house and that station wagon and that membership in the country club or whatever. It was an extraordinarily static future for us. I mean, we were going to go on being more and more affluent and more people were going to live in more nice houses with more nice station wagons and the rest of the world was going to be helped to catch up while we stood still on the whole. And there was very little sense that we were going to be moving to, and where were we going to move to? But it was a period of great optimism on the whole. Uh, there were people who said, well, it took the Soviet Union 30 years to catch up with heavy industry. It will take India 15 and China 10. And all sorts of very elaborate, happy predictions that made it quite easy for people to go on doing exactly what they were doing and not changing anything because it was going to be changed. This was all going to happen and nobody needed to take any great responsibility for it. And then came the next step, the realization of the population explosion and the realization that the population was doubling at such a fast rate that we would have s about seven billion people by the year 2000. And if we didn't do something about it, it would double to 15, 000, uh, 15 billion. And a sudden re realization that this had got to stop somehow. And at the same time, just about the same time, a little bit later, we began taking another look at the environment. And we discovered that we had been doing in this great burst of technological excitement that we'd had since World War II, that we'd invented a, a great many things that were endangering the whole planet. Now, if you 
follow the, these different futures that were being predicted by people and think about the effect it was having there, when the, a nuclear holocaust was being predicted people turned away, they didn't want to believe it, they didn't want to do anything about it, but enough people listened, thought of it as a possibility to be avoided, not something to be uh, resigned to, so that we had pressures put on in both in this country and in Russia, and we gradually developed controls that aren't very perfect, but they're still there, and we haven't had a nuclear war. Then. Then came the sense about what we could do on this planet with all the pressing population on the planet and a great period of optimism. And that period of optimism coincided with people in this country being quite contented to stay where they were. My daughter uh, went to school in Israel in 1956-57 and she wrote back to her girls' school a note saying that uh, isn't every girls' school has a war correspondent. Um, but her comment was that she enjoyed living in a little country like Israel because America is too big and too rich and too happy for her children to feel the blood coursing through her veins. Now this was the late 1950s which was a period of tremendous optimism, a belief that we could solve most of the problems that were confronting us. It's very hard to believe that that was only 15 years ago and that at present we are in the grip of a very pessimistic picture of the future. And we now have prophets that are telling us that well, some of them give us to the, uh, as little as 1985. The more conservative give us to 2030 or 40. Before, if, unless we change our ways, our technological ways, uh, this inf uh, planet may become uninhabitable. Now, we're up against, again, then, a prediction about the future in terms of which we have to act. That is, everybody has to stop and think how likely is the Holocaust that is being predicted again? How likely is this to occur? And is it so likely to occur that there's no use doing anything about it? In which, again, we might behave like the people on the beach. That, well, so we, it won't happen in our lifetime or at least to be pretty old. Um, and there isn't anything to do about it, but it means that life isn't worth living. Or you get some religious cults now where they've gone off in the desert to wait for the end of the world to save their souls, but they're not gonna pay any attention to anything else because the world isn't savable. And we have books like Jay Forrester's World Dynamics in which he makes up a model of how things badly things will go if they go the way they're going, uh, which many people take as a prediction of the end of the world. And we're facing again a question of how seriously we take such predictions and whether we feel there's something that can be done about it. And the possibility that if we believe if we start believing the predictions that uh, the environmentalists are making, and people like Paul Ehrlich and um, Barry Commoner, if we believe them too hard, we won't do anything. And if we don't believe them a little, 
they will come true, which is a, a very difficult thing for a society to deal with. We have to believe in them enough so we'll get to work at once and do something, and yet not have them so discouraging. So, uh, to use the current phrase, that it boggles the mind. And we're having a lot of minds being boggled at present. So you take an environmentalist over to, as I, I went on a seminar that was looking at Eastern Europe this summer, and you go to the beautiful city of Budapest, and a man who'd been giving a lot of lectures on how to recycle water in American sewerage systems went over and looked at Budapest and discovered they'd have to tear the whole city down to make the kind of sewers that were being recommended that weren't ruining the river. Or yesterday in New York City, one of our big water mains burst, and we lost in two or three hours all the water that anybody could possibly have ever saved by not sprinkling their lawns for a hundred years. And the city announced, yes, it's going to have, this is going to happen. It would cost too much to fix it. It's much better to let the water mains burst when they burst. And of course, it, there are a lot of those in New York City, and uh, so a lot of more of them will burst. And you suddenly are up against, how are people going to behave in a city where every time you turn on the radio, you hear something has burst, something has exploded, something has been set on fire, are you going to feel this, this is something that can be managed or not managed? And the whole world at present is being faced with a series of prophecies of this sort. And the whole world has never had to face things like this at once and has never had to work out a strategy. Now, there was a report a couple of weeks ago in Britain of a serious, very serious commission. And one of their reports was, the British must cut their population in half. Now, if you take that sentence and let your imagination work, you can either see a diagram that shows how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are represented by each little man and you have to chop off all their heads, or you can cut it through the middle like that, knock half of them off. The picture of cutting your population in half is rather murderous. You know, and you get a general sense of doing things to people, destroying them in some form. And, uh, or we get pictures presented to us in the United States, we will have to reduce our standard of living. Now, if there's one thing Americans aren't going to ever do is reduce their standard of living. Uh, if it's stated in this way, it becomes such a picture of an undesirable future that the prophecies of doom and the statements of what we might have to do if we didn't get doom blend together. And who wants to live if you can't have a car? And a picture of the future with no automobiles is so terrible that we might just as well have the end of the world. And so any statement that is negative and reductive reinforces, in an odd kind of way, the prophecies of doom and the people who can't bear to think what life would be if we again had trains that ran, um, blend with the people who believe the denunciation of the environmentalists. So that at each step and at each point, we have to look at what these predictions are doing and what a picture of the future will do to people now. That is, it is unless we can picture a future which is practical and which we believe we can reach, then these prophecies of doom will settle down to a degree that people will become apathetic or they'll dance all night or uh, go into mystical trances or do all the things that happened in the Middle Ages when they thought there was going to be an end to the world briefly and their notion of the world was Europe. And the relationship between each picture of the future and this continual pressure, which is perfectly realistic. I'm not, uh, I don't want you to think that I'm suggesting that the picture that we were in danger, we are still in danger, what we might do with nuclear power. And we're very much in danger 
from a population exploding to a point that it's totally unmanageable and we're very much in danger of making this planet uninhabitable these are real dangers whereas the two utopia sorts of pictures that we've worked with since world war two that we could just move off into outer space and set a lot of other planets nicely and the belief that we could export our technology to all the people in the world and they'd all catch up at once. And they'd all have steel mills and television and automobiles and all go to schools just like ours and the whole world would be beautiful. Both of these utopias have proved unreliable. So that we're living in an odd state where we have to realize that we've had a utopias that we're abandoning we have threats that are realistic and we have to balance giving people a picture of the future that makes it worthwhile to live. Now, if we look at the population question as one of the ways in which we think about the future, well, one of the things that people are saying is you have to have zero population. Now, zero population is an unattractive idea who wants to be zero? Who wants their children to be zero? Zero population. And it, it might be necessary, but it's not pleasant to think of as a way of saying it. Saying you have to cut your population in half. No country likes that idea of cutting their population in half. So you're up against the problem. Is there any way that you can face and phrase what has to be done about the future and about the population explosion, which is bearable, bearable in terms of the ideals and values of the people that you're talking to and with. And for instance, instead of saying that we have to have zero population or saying zero population growth or saying that uh, we have to cut the population in half or we have to start reducing the population, uh, you can say instead that we begin to think of the rights of the unconceived, not the, you made a pun with conception a little while ago, um, not of the rights of the unborn, because they're here already, but of the unconceived. And we begin to think of the children who might be born next year, 25 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, as having a right to be born in a world where, that is safe, where there are not too many people, where we're not using up too much power, where we're not using up too many resources. That we postpone inviting as many children to be born until we can invite them to a safer place and that we think of the rights of those who have not been born and not even conceived to be born at a later date. Now, when I was in Samoa, this, I went back to Samoa this year, our first time at, for 46 years. In American Samoa, when I was there, there were 8,000 people. There are now 48,000 happy American Samoans half of whom live in the United States. And they don't see why they shouldn't double their population indefinitely. They're such nice people and they enjoy life and they're so healthy and they're, it's really a lovely culture and therefore everybody likes to have lots of children. And if you mention anything about population control, you get the sort of answer that a doctor who was working on this got from an old chief who said, I have 14 children, I have no trouble with any of them. And she said, where are they? And he said, in California. Um, and of course, he wasn't having any trouble with it. Now, the Samoans will have to be convinced that some, some, all the Samoans in the world don't have to be born in the next generation. They could postpone the invitation a little and make this into a positive instead of a negative. If we think about the changes that are going to have to be made in this country, and they're principally in this country because we're the most technologically advanced country in the world. We've gone the furthest in endangering our environment of 
and in endangering the environment of the whole world because the things we're putting in the ocean go right around the world. And therefore, we're the people that are going to have to make the solutions. Now, if you say to people, you're not going to be allowed to have air conditioning anymore, or you know, you're going to have to give up your automobile, or you're not going to be able to do the things you used to do, that's one way of looking at it. If we say, on the other hand, that we ought to be able to simplify life so that people didn't groan under the weight of things that they live under now. The women don't spend, that the average married woman would no longer spend a third of her time taking back things to the store that didn't fit and didn't work. Another third of her time waiting for somebody to fix the things she's got. Uh, that we have entangled ourselves in a tremendous labyrinth of responsibilities for things that make it rather difficult to have any time to live. And that the next stage after experimenting with the use of technologies we have will be a considerably simplified life. If instead of saying, well, we're not going to have the kind of family life that we've had in the last 25 years, which many people think is the traditional family that was set up on Mount Sinai, but it isn't. It's a kind of family that we've just invented and we could do a lot to disinvent fairly rapidly that the idea of turning every single home into a powerhouse, using enough power to support a whole community, and spending the father spending his life making enough money to get the power for the powerhouse and the wife staying home to tend it, um, that this is a kind of slavery rather than a kind of freedom and that we can develop better family forms where more people can work together and share things, and there'll be more people to share the care of the children. That we don't, won't be facing a destruction of the family. That's what we're facing today, because the nuclear family is too hard for young people to live in. But that if we make more community and cooperative arrangements in the future, all the families will be safer. And if we have a future where nobody has a child they don't want, and where everybody has the sex child they want, that would save an enormous amount, you know, because the number of families that keep on having girls in order to get a boy adds up to a terrible lot. And if we work out, as we probably will very soon, a way of determining sex, we cut down the population immediately, enormously, without cutting it in half. Or, but people wouldn't have children they didn't want. And a very interesting other thing would happen. For the first time in human history, girls would be as chosen as boys. You see, because if you can really choose sex, you've got to choose both. And every girl that would be born would know that she was wanted, and not that they were willing to have a girl after they had four boys, which is the sort of sentiments that they have in Korea. Uh, now, in other words, it's perfectly possible to begin to think about a future in which there will have to be a great many changes, in which we won't use power the way we've been using it, which we won't be discharging all sorts of indigestible chemicals into the sky and into the sea, but which can result in a better form of life and a more human form of life, and a form of life in which people get a great deal more out of it. Because one of the very curious things is that our problem at present is we mustn't use so much energy up because it pollutes the world, and we mustn't make so much junk that we then pile up and pollute the world. And the things that are enjoyable in life, like music, and dancing and singing don't cost a thing, and they don't pollute, and they don't produce the same kind of, of problems that we've been facing. And we can build a picture of the future which will make it worthwhile to try to prevent the kinds of situations that the prophets of doom are building up. But at every point, we have to realize this balance. We have to be somewhat scared and not too scared. 
we have to have what uh, the psychiatrists at one point went around calling good anxiety or good guilt. Now, good anxiety and good guilt f sound very peculiar things to have, I think. But what they meant was you had to be worried enough to pay attention, but not so worried that you were paralyzed. And so that it's going to fall on very much on this generation and very much on this young generation that are now going to vote for the first time to begin to help design a way of looking at the urgency, and there's no doubt about the urgency, of the decisions that we have to make, but setting it in terms that will make it worthwhile to prevent those prophecies of doom from coming true. And this is the thing that we haven't been doing very successfully in the last 10 years, and so we've had a great number of people who didn't think it was worthwhile to try to revise the world, and other people who thought it had to be done at once. And we haven't yet built pictures of what kind of a world we can have in which we can cut down a great many of the dangers that are facing us. We can look on the future as better than the present, much better than the present. Not a reduction in what we're doing, not a reduction in what we've hoped, but something that is worth working for, but work for it under the shadow of the knowledge that if we don't, things are going to be very bad. But this is what uh, the older people here who lived through World War II will realize we were able to do in World War II. We were, we were so convinced that a victory from Hitler would have meant the end of everything that we valued that we pulled the country together to do extraordinary things very fast. We've always been able to do this in terms of a major war. We now have to invent some way of pulling the country together without a major war. We've no country has ever done this successfully before. But the one thing that seems to me to make it possible that we'll be able to do it is that all the wars in the past have been over territory. And territory is, is a very difficult thing. If I'm standing on this place and this platform, nobody else can stand here. If I build a house somewhere, nobody else can build a house on that piece of land. But the two things that we have to think about now are the oceans and the air. And the peculiarity of the air is that everybody in this room is sharing the same air. And if something goes wrong with that air, we're all dead. But there isn't any way we can cut it up into your air and my air. And I'll, have, I'll defend the frontier of my air while you defend the frontier of your air. And it's air and the, wa uh, the oceans that are the things that we have to preserve now. And this gives us a kind of chance at a kind of cooperation that the human race has never been asked to do before. And so we have a chance to develop a new, new way of handling things and maybe build a new kind of civilization which will make it safe to live on this planet. Dr. Mead has uh, consented to answer questions. If any of you have questions, will you please uh, stand? We will try to repeat the question so that others in the audience can understand, uh, can hear the question as well as the answer. Uh, 
Um, the question is, doesn't the uh, kind of world that I'm, kind of cooperation that I'm talking about, uh, require a sublimation of the kind of consumer sovereignty on which this country has flourished, and also a stronger state or stronger power, possibly by young people. I don't think a strong state is improved by young people, particularly. Um, if young people had a strong state, highly strong centralized state, they'd undoubtedly behave just as badly as old people. You know, I don't think there's any special virtue in being young uh, when you're dealing with a bad institution. Uh, now, you've got two questions. One is, don't we have to develop a different psychology? But our consumer psychology is very new. The kind of thing that you're talking about is only about 50 years old. I mean, it really was, it was born with Mr. Ford and the Ford car. And before that, we used to make things that lasted, you know? <laughs> before that, when you took, untied the string on a package, you untied it carefully, you undid the knots, you wrapped it up and put it in a teapot. That was called by people outside New England, New England stinginess, and inside New England it was called frugality and there was a lot of it in Iowa. Uh, <laughs> this consumer psychology that was related to a new kind of manufacturing and a general notion that you could always make more and you ran the system and ran up the gross national product by making more things that went to pieces so people had to buy new ones, is brand new. It's, a, it's obnoxious, but it's new, then, you know the kind of, of suburban, isolated family that we have, where women can't, never can cooperate with another woman, and so men have to work quite hard to be cooperative because they're the only thing around, and um, everybody's isolated from everybody else, is brand new. It isn't the kind of family we had even 75 years ago. The things that we're worrying about are all quite new. And if you realize that 75 years ago, man did not have the capacity to destroy the world. He hadn't invented synthetics. He didn't know how to manage, uh, how to invent unmanageable chemicals that ruin the sea and kill lakes. He hadn't invented the idea of everybody living in a separate box in a development somewhere. And the whole thing that you call consumer psychology didn't exist. Now, if it didn't exist in your grandfather's day, you know, we can't have ruined everybody's character quite that fast. And we have a lot of possibilities of changing this kind of character very rapidly, if we mean to. We have all the devices for changing public opinion rapidly. We've got TV, we've got radio, we've got the mass media. We can put anything around the world in 15 minutes now. As for a centralized state, the one point about a centralized state is that it spends its time stopping people from rebelling against it. And people spend their time trying, and you don't get a very good result. I think what we want to work for is a more diffuse state, but many things planned that are on a planetary level. Those are, they look like contradictory things, but they're not. Well, I explain why the two things that I just mentioned are not contradictory. That is, that we have to do some things on a planetary basis, and yet we can have more diffusion of power. Uh, at present, all our, our units of the government are wrong. That is, we have nation states trying to run things that are continental. You know, we have that lovely border, undefended border between us and Canada, but smog doesn't know anything about that border. It goes right across. Pipelines go right across. Uh, at present, the Canadian government has made some kind of new record, a Canadian commission has made some kind of new representation about drugs that sounds wonderful, except if the Canadians did it and the Americans didn't, it 
too many people would immediately go to Canada. Um, there are a great many things that can only be done on a continental basis, or not at all. Things like pipelines, things like planning roads, uh, things we ought to have, the things that are called utilidors. So we ought to now plot out for this entire continent good-sized underground tunnels that we can put through any form of power we can imagine, lasers, all sorts of things, and plot it out for good so people can build decent towns that aren't going to be dug up every week. Um, and we wouldn't have to build all those utilidors, but we'd know where they'd go if they went, so where it was safe to put other things, where it was safe to put towns. And at the same time we did this, if we had a continental scale for the things that ought to be continental, we'd make each small community much safer. And it would be possible to give small communities much more autonomy than we have now. And the same thing would hold for the world. But at present, we have the wrong size unit. New York City is a terrible unit. And it's also a terrible unit to have some miserable little township somewhere that can hold up a freeway or hold up a pipeline, because it, it's the wrong size for what it's doing. So that one of our big jobs is going to have to be to revise scale. Let's see if we have one. In my experience of the world, have I found any area or country where this kind of cooperation existed? Well, we've had countries that have been stable for hundreds and hundreds of years, single groups of, of people where and groups of people where warfare hasn't been necessary and where they have built up a sufficiently habitual way of life so that it was possible to use the resources they had with some degree of uh, uh, preservation of those resources. But no people in the world have ever been faced with what we're faced with now. And I think it's very important to realize that we've got new problems that have never been here before and new ways of meeting them both. If we had only the problems and not any way of meeting them, we could feel pretty desperate. But uh, we do have, at the same time that we've got to get news around the world, we've got TV satellites to get it around the world. 